my name is Renaud Roy, and uh, I was born and raised in Iroquois Falls. Um, I grew up in, on a farm, actually, in Iroquois Falls, and uh, that taught me some very good um, ethics about work and the necessity of being responsible. Uh, you know, when you grow on a farm as a child, you're assigned different tasks very early uh, in life, you know, whether it's looking after the chicken or feeding the cows or haying in the summer. So, uh, yeah, I spent uh, most of my life in Iroquois Falls. I have worked 13 years for the municipality of Iroquois Falls. I was working for the recreation department. And uh, after that, um, I actually went and lived in Romania for uh, 15 years. And uh, as you may know, Romania was a former uh, communist country. And when I went there, uh, the very first time was 94. Um, there were still evidence of the revolution that had taken place in the De December of 89. And um, so that was really very shocking for me because as a, as a, as a Canadian, there, we don't, we're never exposed to violence of that kind of level. But you would walk on the streets and see bullet holes where actually there was people shooting at each other. So it was actually the police against the army in Romania. So that, was, that really impacted me, but what I just want to say from that is that communism fell because people were hungry for freedom. It, it, they had been oppressed and controlled by the state, an oversized government that was controlling every aspect of their lives, from what they could drive to how they could heat, to how much television they had, to how much electricity they had. It was, every aspect of their lives was, was driven. So uh, by, it was controlled by the government. So what happened is that the people came to a place and time that they, were, they could just no longer put up with it because they were rationed also, so they didn't have all the food. Even when I first went the first time, the stores just had a, you know, a jar of jam here and a jar of jam there. So there was very, it was very scarce, uh, very scarce what uh, they had available to them. So not only that, but also under communism, because government wanted to uphold a certain narrative, um, what they would actually also arrest any intellectuals or people of faith that would contradict their government narrative of things. So basically, people were living in fear and under oppression. And that finally drove the masses of people, imagine this, it drove them to the place where the, the regular citizens were facing tanks. So in large cities, the uh, uh, Nikolai Ceausescu, which was a dictator, ordered actually the army to start shooting at the people. And, uh, but what drove the people to actually stand, I, I'm thinking of China when that happened, you know, that, that man that stood in front of the tank. What drove it was that desire to be free and to rid themselves of governmental oppression. <music>
that are the basis for every policy option that they consider, and those are individual freedom, and that's, again, that is so important. Personal responsibility, it's nice to have freedom, but when you are free, then you should also be responsible, because when you are not responsible for yourself, someone has to actually become responsible, and the way that that happens, they have to cut on your individual freedoms to actually control those aspects of your lives where you're not responsible. And the other two core, uh, core values are fairness. So we want to apply fairness to every Canadian regardless of sex, religion, color, ethnicity, and all of this. So fairness and respect for each other. I just want to say this, that um, Recently, maybe about two weeks ago, I had to call the police because I received a, an email that was a threat to my life. Um, I received that to our email address of our website, and somebody who identified as Antifa Timmins said that because I was running for this party, that I would regret this for the rest of my life. So I just, I just, and I know uh, that there are. Uh, these people that will simply not accept different ways of thinking and they have very narrow minded mindsets of how things should be and uh, so I called the police and I am sad that Canada has come to the place where now we cannot respect each other when we have differences of opinions and ideas so uh, I believe that for us the best way is that to give to grant people their own freedom so that your the government does not actually side with a certain group over a certain other group we want equality we want fairness and we want respect for each other and so there should not be uh, anything like this in a in a tolerant uh, in a tolerant society Concerning our platform, this is something different than maybe the other parties, is that nobody seems to be talking about fiscal responsibility. So right now we are the only party that, that offers to tackle the debt, the national debt. Because this thing, in the, last, in the last four years, for example, of the Trudeau government, we've added about 70 to 80 billion dollars to the national debt. Now, every single year, we are paying $27 billion, $27 billion on, the, on debt payments alone, on the interest. So imagine, if you will, if we had the freedom to take those $27 billion and invest that in the, in the welfare of Canadians. So basically, every time we, the government makes a budget, he needs to allow, well, the debt is going to cost us this much. Therefore, we have less in that fiscal envelope to actually meet the needs of our seniors, of our veterans. Remember when Prime Minister Trudeau speaking at a town hall with a, uh, with a vet who had lost his leg in battle said, you are simply asking for too much, uh, for more than what we can give right now. I find that very regretful because at the same time he, he piled on to the debt. And, and that's not just the Liberals. The other uh, parties in power, the, the Conservatives, have done the same thing, where they've piled on the debt, so now we are actually having to take a big slice of that pie and, and use it to pay interest on the debt we have. So I think, I think that needs to be addressed. Um, we are uh, a, a party that is proposing bold prophecy, uh, um, policy uh, changes and reform. For example, we want to simplify the tax code. Right now, when I did my income tax, I almost received a book this thick to fulfill my income, to uh, fill in my income tax uh, return. And so we want to simplify uh, the tax code. And you say, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is that uh, you're not going to have to spend uh, a lot of money on getting someone else to do because you're going to be able to do it yourself and we want to change the brackets. Now we have five brackets of our tax code, we will reduce it to two. So people who are earning between zero and $15,000, right now the personal exemption is 12,000 around there. So we are gonna increase that personal exemption to $15,000. So who will that, well that will not make a very big difference for people who are high earners, but the people who are actually in the, in the, in the lower class, this will make a big difference because they won't have to pay any income tax at all in the, 15, the first $15,000.
we also want to put Canadian citizens first. Canadians have a right to expect services in return for the taxes they pay, right? Common sense. If I pay uh, for service uh, for my water and my sewer services uh, in Iroquois Falls, I expect that my $80 goes towards the infrastructures and the service that I'm getting. But the frustrating thing right now is that many Canadians are sending their tax money to Ottawa, not having any control whatsoever how that money is being used. And for example, we are sending some $5 billion a year overseas. Now, as, as nice, as, as generous as that may seem, Canadians are not expecting to pay tax for projects, infrastructures projects overseas. So as a party, we want to put our Canadian citizen, our taxpayers first in our, in, our, in our policy proposals. So we want to cut down on foreign aid and repatriate this money back to Canada and actually build, for example, uh, we were asked the question, how could we improve situations in our northern communities among the First Nations people? Well, building an infrastructure, having um, an all-season road going up to Moussini and reaching those communities, that would change the way of life for them very, so very easy because right now they're paying exorbitant food prices. Some people may not like the name, but regardless, we are always holding up the people of Canada before uh, our own personal agenda as a party. We are not ideology driven. We want Canadians to enjoy the most, uh, the most freedom as possible. So everything is always taken to that, into that, under that light. So we are also the only party right now that wants to reform our, our immigration system. Some people are accusing us of, of being racist because we simply want to always think, is this the best policy for Canadians right now? I'm not, a, I'm, not I'm no racist. My wife is, a, is an, immig an immigrant, so obviously I have absolutely no issues with, with immigrants. But right now, we, there are only about 26% of uh, newcomers to Canada that are coming specifically to fill in uh, uh, roles or jobs that Canadians are, not, are simply not able to fulfill. So we want to increase that number to 50 and even more that any immigrants coming to Canada would be granted a job and could integrate into Canadian society. So for that is that we will reduce, we are proposing to reduce the numbers of, of immigrants overall and we also want to, uh, to uh, touch on the illegal uh, crossers that have been crossing into Canada illegally. There is 45,000 since January 2017. There's 45,000 that have crossed illegally. There, you can go on the internet, you can look up photos, and actually the RCMP or officers are actually helping them across the border carrying their, their luggage. Now, these people, when they, they have to apply for refugee status, right now 40% are being denied. But that takes, it can take up to three years to process and it's costing Canadian taxpayers thousands and thousands, millions, literally millions of dollars that are being poured out. Whereas, for example, I have a, a, a friend who is right now in Thailand and she's in a refugee camp in Thailand, a refugee from Pakistan because she's under, her life is in danger there. Now, these are the kind of people that we want to bring in as, as refugee, not people that are crossing in from the United States. Because obviously, if they came from a place where their lives were in danger, they could have, the, the law says that you should apply first for refugee status in the, the country where you arrive, where you set your, your, your feet. So there's, there's what we call uh, economic migrants, people that are just kind of looking for a better life, better jobs. And that's understandable, but it's, it shouldn't be up to the Canadian taxpayers to be footing the bill uh, for those kind of people. For example, I want to share this. Uh, this spring, I invited two young white university students from South Africa to come and spend one month with us. And I wanted them to share just what was going on in their country, because right now, there's a lot of um, violence perpetrated and even murders uh, against white farmers in South Africa. So I wanted to bring these two white university students to Canada 
and the Canadian consulate in South Africa refused their visitor's visa to come to Canada. What was the, 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 the basis for their refusal? They said that they were afraid that they might not want to return to South Africa. So you can imagine, we had said, we, I had let, written a letter saying that we would provide their food, their lodging, their transportation in Canada. The Canadian taxpayers would not have had to pay a single penny. We would have looked after them completely for one month. So they were refused a visa to come into Canada. And yet here we are, people crossing illegally, not through an official border point. They're crossing into Canada and we are paying and we are putting that on the bill on the tab of the Canadian taxpayers. So somebody needs to say something. Somebody needs to say, whoa, what, what are we doing? So this, I could speak and speak and speak. There's so many different things right now that are broken and are broken in our country. And that is why I'm running. I, I was I was looking forward to retirement very very in the very near future and here I am running for politics and doing crazy hours right now of campaigning because I believe we can do so much better for the, than this as a country I'm no politician I, I'm, a, I'm a laborer I, I, I've worked with nonprofit organizations I've actually founded my own in Romania I've worked with charities and I see that uh, many aspects of our, of our governing uh, people in Ottawa are not, are not uh, uh, serving the best interests of Canadians. And that is why I'm running. One of the things that we are hearing is that people feel that we are neglected up here because we're so far away, we're so isolated, like, like, you, like you're saying, and people feel that Governments will focus their attention and their investments where there are more, there's more. You wonder if it's vote pondering because if they offer more money, the big more money within those large cities or those large centers, of course, there are large bases of where there's a lot of seats also. So there is some self preservation for governments to support that. And so people feel that oftentimes they feel that we don't exist because we get very, a very small share of the pie when it comes to so people are paying taxes just like any other Canadian so we're sending our taxes to Ottawa but very very little of it is, is coming back into our writing so I believe that we can address that very very in a very simple way and it's by basically the federal government taking less from our pockets so that we have more for because for, this I would like to see our own money being spent up here I'm not asking other parts of Canada to support our needs of our riding, but I'm asking for the ability to be able to keep Northern Ontario dollars in Northern Ontario. I don't want to send them overseas, but I don't want to send them to Quebec City, Montreal, Toronto, or Vancouver either. So the best way to do that is for our money to not go to Ottawa in the first place. Let it stay here. Let it be invested locally. So. Uh, so that, of course, that, as that aspect affects so many different things, whether it's mining, agriculture, uh, help for seniors, uh, help for the disabled that, are, that we have locally, uh, issues that we have locally. So if we had that, uh, that, uh, that space uh, of maneuver with our finances, we could do so much more for the North. And that's one of the things that I want to see done, keeping more of our Ontario Northern, do Northern Ontario dollars here. That's, a, that's such a super, that's a very legitimate uh, answer, uh, question, sorry, and a concern. Exactly like what I said, right now we are sending about annually $5 billion overseas. So right now we are having a deficit of approximately $20 billion a year. So we can repatriate that $5 billion. Another uh, large, large amount of money that is being spent is on corporate or what we call crony capitalism or cor corporate welfare where we actually give subsidies, subsidies and grants to large corp corporations because they're mismanaging their, finan their finances. So, for example, in 2014 and 2015, 14 billion, 14 billion dollars, can you add to that? That's a head scratcher. 14 billion dollars was given to corporate welfare and subsidies to the company. So we are not even gonna do 
We're going to eliminate that completely. We do not want to play favoritism over, oh, yeah, you're sure, you get some money, but you, the little guy, you don't get anything. So we'll support those big guys. We want to eliminate all corporate welfare, all subsidies to, to corporations. And we want, so right there, I've already showed you $19, $19 billion where we want to re, uh, redirect that money. The other thing that I've mentioned already was the fact that this illegal uh, migration that is happening over by cut by resolving that issue and we can we already have some policy proposals well we want to establish the all of the canadian border u.s canadian border as a, an official point of entry so when people try to come in well they'll be said they'll be told sorry this is not an official point of entry please go and please apply from the united states apply from there and then if you're approved then you'll be asked to come in and, and have the interview and all of this so we're going to save again, we're going to save millions of dollars here that we can then turn around and, and put into, uh, into balancing the budgets. So it's really not all that, not all that, and we're not going to touch our social services. I want to make that clear because oftentimes that's why well, we see maybe some of that with the Ford government and that. So people think, oh, cuts. We're not going to cut anything to Canadians. We're going to, what we want to cut is, is foreign, well, uh, foreign uh, donations uh, foreign aid, because we, we believe that money was given by Canadians for Canadians primarily. So we're going to do that and also with the corporate uh, welfare that we're going to eliminate completely. I like Max because um, for him there's no taboo subject. And to me that is freedom. Because right now with political correctness, you even this is one thing you were asking me, like, uh, um, what are some of the things that are coming out from the people in our writing? Well, now it's funny, but it's sad that we are at a place where before somebody says something, the first thing they will have to say, if they want to, let's say, share an opinion, they'll say, I'm not a racist or anything. And it's, it's sad, and I know they're not racist. We are not racists. But now, anytime that somebody says something that which some, someone else disagrees, Rather than debating the subject or the opinion, they call each other names. So I like Max, the fact that say, you know what, we are Canadians, we are free, we have free speech and we need to protect that here. And there is no taboo subject with him. So we, we, he will not muzzle any of his MPs. Because right now, some of these other parties, you have to toe the party line. Max has committed and promised that none of us. So if I have specific issues, relevant to Timmins James Bay. I will not be muzzled and I can share my conscience, I can share the, the concerns of the residents of this, uh, this writing rather than having to tow a general party line. And that's, I love that about, about Max. I would just say this, that in voting today, or on the, 20, on the 21st of October, when you vote, Think about what kind of Canada you want to have in 10 years from now. Think about the, what kind of Canada you want in 20, 25 years from now. Because the decisions that you will make, the decisions that you will take, the party that you will support on October 21st will have ramifications and repercussions in 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Whether it's economically, whether it's the, the, the political landscape of, of, of Canada, the makeup of Canada, you got to think not just for today, but think even in the long term as you vote on, on October 21st. And I invite you to go online, go to People's Party of Canada, check out our policy proposals there. They are just so common sense, you'll say, wow, you'll see yourself in there, that's me, that's me, I'm a Canadian and I can relate so well to these policies. So, don't let uh, name calling deter you from doing the fair evaluation of what each party has to offer, what they are proposing. So I invite you to uh, to look me up also, Timmins James Bay, PPC Timmins James Bay, and People's Party of Canada. Check out our policy proposals and uh, write me. I will I will respond to every single person. I will respond personally to every single person that writes for more information. <music>